taking us into the throne room today. Hey, uh, um, I want to thank you for being here today. I didn't know if there was going to be two or three of you here today, um, considering what's happening in our world. But the same Holy Spirit that is here is with you online today as well. He's in your living room or uh, in your car as you're watching this service. The same God that is here is omnipresent. He is with us today. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So my name is Rick. I'm one of the pastors here at Pikes Peak Christian Church. And next month, my wife and I will be married 40 years. I thank her, right? And I will uh, be um, next year, um, I will have 41 years of ministry. Being called into ministry as a 19-year-old, had my first opportunity to minister at a church with uh, being a youth pastor. I had no idea what I was doing. The first message I gave, I stood up, I spoke for three minutes, I sat down, that's all I had. (laughs) Pastor said, good job. He was trying to encourage me. Now today I'll tell you I have seven pages of notes. Now hold on and put your seatbelt on because the eyes aren't as good as they used to be. It is in large print. All right. We also have had the opportunity to serve here at Pikes Peak Christian Church for the past 13 years. I want to thank you. I am honored to come alongside of you and walk the journey of life with you. So whether I'm at a hospital holding the hand of a loved one that is going from this life to the next or counseling you in my office or overseeing all the ministries that we have, there is hope for this world today. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Now, here's what I understand with all that. I am truly, truly blessed. The Lord has been good to me, and I hope you can say the same thing. In the midst of the turmoil and the struggle that we face today, God is still on his throne. He did not roll off his throne whenever coronavirus arrived. He was like, hey, Jesus, did you see that coming? Nope, I didn't see it. He wasn't surprised by it. He is with us today, and he is the hope of the world for you and I today. Now, somebody asked me this past week, Pastor, is God's silence in the midst of all that's happening in this world? And I say, absolutely not. He is alive. He is well. The grave is empty. And he is at the right hand of the Father today. Amen? Amen. All right. So here's what I do know. We have his word. He is not silent. And there are things in God's word that he has given to us. They were good for The day that they were written, they are good for the past and they are good for the present today. Now, here's what I know. Jesus said, he who have no sin, let him cast the first stone. That word was good to then and it is good today. We are all sinners saved by grace. No one can cast a stone and this world is in need of the Savior today. Can I hear an amen? Amen. The same scripture tells us about when Jesus met in that upper room. You see these towels here. One of the last things that he did before he left this earth and dying on the cross for you and I is he took a towel and he took a basin and he started washing feet. Today we are in need within our culture, within our society, within this world for some feet washing to take place. I'm not asking you to wash Richard's feet. (laughs) All right? But what I'm asking you to do is to stop and to listen and to be obedient to what God is calling you to do today. If he tells you to wash Richard's feet, you do it. All right? But God is calling us to do some things today. He is not silent. He is asking the church to rise up. It's time for the church... To be the church. God says the church is my bride. And man, whenever he talks about his bride, she is beautiful. But whenever the church has got it wrong, my friend, she is ugly. She's just ugly. 
all right? But when we get it right, when we come to that place where we know that the gifts and the talents that God has given us are only given to us to glorify Him. It's all about Him. It's not about us today. And there's so much within America today. I'll throw us all in there. Within this world today that is about me. It's about I. What I want. What I didn't get. And God's saying, bend your knee to me and surrender to me. Come on, church. He needs us today. And he needs that beautiful bride, not the ugly one. So years ago, one day in church, I was singing my heart out. And I was just singing out and praising the Lord. And and my son, who is very musically inclined, leaned over to me and said, Dad, don't ever do that again. (laughs) And I said, what, son? He said, sing. (laughs) Today's message is on humility. We need a little humility today to be able to stop and to listen to what's going on. And I'm asking you to have humility to surrender yourself to God and to answer him by saying, yes, Lord, because you have said so. How many of you would agree with me that there's plenty of opportunities in this world for a little bit of humility to take place? And I believe that when humility is in place, all other virtues can be built on top of that because it's in humility that we get a healthy foundation of who we are. It's not about me. It's about him. So when I say um, that God wants to build up some things in us, we're going to take a look at that today. But humility has got to be at that foundation. I think you would also agree with me that some people don't learn to be humble until later in life. I wish I would have listened to my son. Where's Pastor Matt? Is he here? He's here somewhere. Pastor Matt knows that I can't sing. All right? I have tried to get on the worship team, and I just don't cut it. And here's the deal. It is critically important for you to know the gifts and the talents that God has given you and to stick with that, to not press it and to say, hey, maybe I can sing. So here's how it played out in my life. My son said, Dad, don't ever do that again. Well, just a couple months after that, I had the opportunity to lead the hymn sing at our church. Rick, we want you to lead. Oh, yeah, I got this. So I got up there, and it was recorded. And let me tell you, after it was all done, I said, Lord, have mercy. It was not good. Here's what I love. In all things, whenever I get to heaven, things are perfected. I'm going to get me a voice when I get to heaven. All right? Yes. Yes. Here's, here's the important lesson, life lesson. It is critically important to learn early in life who you are, and that includes knowing your strengths and your weaknesses and be okay with that. I'm okay with um, not being able to sing. People around me may not be okay with it, but I'm okay with that because here's, here's the deal. Life will make so much more sense when we accept our place. God has a place for you. He has a calling on your life, and you've got to zero in on that and know exactly what God has called you to do. Okay, so I want you to do this with me. Um, On this screen right up here, I want you to say this with me. Without God, I am nothing. In Him, I am everything. And through Him, I can do all things. Amen? Do you agree with that statement? I believe that the sooner we learn this, the sooner you will be able to reach your highest potential in the kingdom of God. I also believe that God lets you excel so you can make a difference for him. So if you um, are blessed in some area of your life, um, it is because God has given you the gifts and the talents to be able to do that task or that event or whatever it is that God's 
calling you to. Let me say that again. I believe that God lets you excel or be successful so you can make a difference for him. That's the only reason that we are here, to glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. All right. Have you ever met someone? Oh, what? Let me stop right there. Have you ever met somebody that's just full of pride? What's the opposite of humility? Pride. And pride is not so much as... Um, bragging as it is the illusion that I am the center and I can manage everything on my own. God, I don't need you. I got this. God's saying, really? You think you got this? There's some hard lessons to be learned whenever we don't let God be on the throne. Now, have you ever met someone that's just so full of themselves? They throw out all their titles. They throw out all their accomplishments. And you're standing there thinking, how fast can I get away from this guy? (laughs) To the point that you want to barf. Like, I've heard enough. You know who's not impressed with your titles? Not impressed with your accomplishments? God. You know what he's more impressed with? He's more interested in your character than he is your title. Write that down. God is more interested in my character than my title. And so what we're talking about here is what God wants to build up in you. He wants us to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and self-control and meekness, which is humility. It means because I am in Christ, if you are in Christ, you are called to be different. And here's how it plays out. When you're driving down the highway, come on now, somebody say, ouch. Mm -hmm. may have happened on your way to church today right somebody cuts you off or yeah somebody says speed up well because you're in Christ you don't get to use your middle finger folks come on it's like this no There's this battle, there's this tug of war that's going on inside of you, and that's the Holy Spirit that's reminding you, I've called you to be different. Come on, church. He's looking for his bride. He's called us to be different. Be in the world, but not of it. Now listen, close. If you don't get this, He will permit you to go through some things until you are totally his. You got quiet. (laughs) Let me say that. If you don't get this humility thing, if he's not on the throne, he'll permit you to go through some things until you are totally his. God, I surrender. I bend my knee to you. And, Lord, I ask that you would work through me. Amen? Amen. Now, Scripture tells us that laughter is good medicine for the soul. Right? It's good. And I think that if you would learn to laugh at yourself, humility would fall into place so much easier. So um, no matter what position or what title or What accomplishments you've had, humility, um, humor is good for the soul. So you may have heard about the teacher that was given a lesson in circulation, on circulation of the blood. She said, now class, if I stood on my head, the blood, as you know, would run into it and I would turn red in the face. Third graders, by the way. Yes, teacher, that is true, teacher. Then why is it that while I'm standing upright in the ordinary position, the blood doesn't run into my feet? Little fella got quiet just like he did a moment ago. Little fella finally responded and says, because your feet ain't empty, teacher. Oh, Oh. 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 Oh.
is good medicine. It is the best medicine to cure pride. Happened in my own life years ago, um, getting ready for church, and I think I was speaking that morning, and and I didn't want to wake up Sue, so it's dark in our room, and I'm in the closet, and I had shoes that were the same color, brown and black. So I'm down there fumbling around, and I think, oh, that's smooth, that one's smooth, that's right, that's left, I got a pair. And it's dark. I throw them on, I get up, go on to church, and um, I'm standing up front, and somebody says, hey, pastor, you got one black shoe and one brown shoe on. What's up with that? Said, humor is good for us, right? So I just went with it. You know, it was all good. All right. So here's here's the deal. Humility. What is it? I'm going to go through four things with you today. What is humility? What does the Bible say about um, humility and pride? Why does it matter? And then uh, give you a picture of how then we should live in the midst of this time that we're in. So, humility, why does it matter? Um, Well, it starts with uh, this, um, acknowledging, um, God, I need you. Someone said humility believes that God is able to lead. It just... God, I trust you. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and I trust you. It's in that place where humility is best found that I am in great need. You are God, and I am not. So it gets me out of the way and lets Jesus be on the throne. It's best seen in the life of Moses. You remember the story of Moses, the Old Testament. God has a... A job for Moses to do. And he comes to Moses. He says, Moses, I want you to lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses has all these excuses at the beginning. Lord, I, 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 I can't, can't talk. Remember? He said, I have a stuttering issue. And I'm not making fun of that. I'm just repeating the story. But he says, I can't do it, God. God, they won't believe me. They won't trust me. I don't have the ability to be the leader that you're looking for. And God reminds Moses, Moses, who made your mouth? You did, God. I am, will be with you. I will speak for you. God, I'm not sure. So he gave him a staff. He said, God was in that staff. The power of God came through Moses. And we saw tremendous miracles take place with Moses leading the the people through that dark time. How many of you know that we're in dark times today? We need God um, to speak to us. We need God to show up in power and might. We need the church to be the church today. Now, Moses got himself in trouble later on. He's leading the people and he's, got, he's thinking, I'm the man. All right? And here's how, he, here's how that played out. All the people were lined up for, let's just say, miles and miles. And they couldn't get to Moses. Moses was like, I've got to be. And he kept on saying, I've got to be the person. I've got to be the person. I've got this. They come to me. And the people are exasperated. Moses got in the way. He didn't lean on what God had called him to do. And he wanted to use people around him to also lead those individuals to the promised land. He had a father-in-law named Jethro. I always always say he had a father-in-law issue already. (laughs) Anybody? No. Don't, Don't raise your hand. Put your hand down. I saw that hand. Jethro comes to him and says, look, this is what you need to do. You need to trust other people. We are trusting you, church. You are the church. You are the church. You, 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 you. 
We are the church, and combined, we're going to get the job done in the midst of this dark time. I hope that we'll shine bright, and I hope that the bride is beautiful. Will you help me make sure the bride is beautiful? Will you answer the call of God? Humble yourself. Obey him. He's going to ask you to do some crazy things. Now, I tell you, whenever you're asked to do some crazy things, make sure it lines up with his word. Meet with an elder, meet with a pastor, meet with those that you trust, and make sure that it lines up, okay? It's important that we do that today. C.S. Lewis says this, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Mother Teresa said, humility is the mother of all virtues, purity, charity, and obedience. It is being humble that our love is revealed, Humility. What is it? It's dependence on God and God alone. What does the Bible say about pride and humility? Well, God hates or opposes pride, and he gives both warnings about pride, and also he rewards the humble. And we have so many um, pictures within God's word about that. In each of these verses that I'm going to share with you, Um, you'll see that pride brings destruction and humility brings benefit to God and as um, a side benefit, you as well. I'm going to share how that plays out. So in Proverbs 11.2, there should be red lights flashing right now. Warning. Warning. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. Red lights. And there may be something going off inside of you right now where the Holy Spirit's just speaking to you and saying, um, let's get this cleaned up in your life. How many uh, people have you known, whether politician, pastor, CEO, janitor, whoever in your world on the way to the top that they have had pride in their life and it's caused them to have great disgrace as they're climbing. Here's the reward in 11.2. But with the humble is wisdom. How many of you know we all need a little bit of wisdom today? On a daily basis, here at the church, pastors and elders, we are praying for wisdom. God, speak to us. We are in desperate need of you. Proverbs 18, 12 says this. Pride first, then the crash. But humility is the precursor to honor. Early in my ministry, I worked with a senior pastor that said this place would be nothing without me. Mm. Ugly church. Ugly bride. This church would be nothing without me. And I wanted to puke. And now God was probably pretty upset with hearing something like that. It wasn't long that he fell and the church crumbled right behind him. Pride first, then the crash. Proverbs 29, 23, warning. Pride lands you flat on your face. Humility prepares you for honors. How many of you know the name Dawson, um, excuse me, Dawson Troutman? Dawson Troutman was the founder of Navigators, and he was a tremendous leader, now home with the Lord. And there's this story about him um, at his funeral. There was someone speaking, and he um, the speaker said he was, uh, Dawson was visiting um, Taiwan on one of his overseas trips. And during the visit, he hiked with um, the pastors back into the mountain villages to meet some of the national Christians. It was raining. It was like a monsoon. And the story goes on that they're, they're into their knees with mud or up to their knees in, in mud. And uh, at the end of that trip... Um, Dawson gave some great messages. He encouraged those pastors and those national Christians. 
And at the end of that trip, um, someone asked this pastor uh, what he remembered most about Dawson Troutman. And without hesitation, he replied, he cleaned my shoes. Servant leader, humbled himself, got himself to the place where it's not so much important about what I say from this stage. It's more important that when I come off of this stage, am I able to take that bowl? Am I able to take that towel? Am I able to wash feet? Can I shake my brother's hand? Can I lay my hand on somebody's shoulder and pray for them? Can I, um, whenever there's something important in my life and somebody's losing their life, can I stop and can I be there? Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. When I was a child, I learned this song. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. My friends, it's time for the church to rise up. It's time for the church to be that beautiful bride. We are a broken nation And we are in need of Christ to show up and say, Church, I need you. We have that opportunity. Well, there's lots that God wants to speak to us today. I want to also share with you in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, and says this, he gives favor to the humble. He gives favor to the humble. And it's best seen in the life of Peter in Luke chapter 5. We have this beautiful story of Peter. Now, Jesus has just been done, got done teaching on the shoreline. And he, said, he looks over and he's... Um, Peter and the other guys are not his disciples yet. And he says to them, hey, guys, um, can I borrow your boat? Because I have some more things that I want to teach today. And while we're out there, um, uh, Peter, um, uh, could you just throw your net on the other side of the boat? Now, can you imagine what was taking place in Peter's mind? Okay, we'll let you borrow the boat. But do you know who I am? I am Peter, the great fisherman. I know how to fish. So God, you go on and do your teaching, Jesus, and I'll take care of the fishing part. Finally, um, Peter decides, what, what else do I have to lose? So he recognizes, he begins to recognize, and I think it was the Holy Spirit speaking within him. And he says this, Lord, Because you have said so, I will do it. Now, it seemed crazy. They had fished all night, and they had caught one little minnow. But, Lord, because you have said, I will do it. And they threw the net on the other side of the boat, and the story goes on, and it says that the boat was so full, their nets were breaking, and the the boat was full, and they had to call their other buddies over to fill the other boats up. Now, let me tell you. You and I are just a little bit like Peter today. God asked us to do something crazy. Or, Lord, I tried that in the past. It didn't work. And God's saying, put it on the other side of the boat. And he's waiting for us to respond by saying, Lord, because you have said so, I will do it. There is great reward when we obey And we humble ourselves before the Lord. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Don't miss out on God's blessing because you're too proud to do what God's calling you to do. There's also a um, blessing and healing in 
that comes with humility. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we have this tremendous story of this guy named Naaman. Naaman was the chief commander of the Syrian army. He was successful. He was noble, valiant, um, but yet he had this one issue, the Bible tells us. He had leprosy, and he was um, a man of great power and, and great position, but there was no physician that could help him. There, the, even the king couldn't help him. I'm just going to throw this in there. There is a great, great issues within our land. There's no physician. There's no government that can fix these things. It will only be by the power of the Lord that this land is healed. So King Ben-Hadad couldn't do anything for Naaman. Yet it was his servant girl, we're told, who loved the Lord. She loved the Lord and she told Naaman to go see the prophet Elisha in Samaria. Now can you imagine what this great chief commander of the Syrian army was thinking? Hey, young lady, servant girl, do you know who I am? I am the king's right-hand man. I have led the army and I have conquered enemies and you just don't understand who I am. But because he was in such anguish and pain, he was forced to try something. So he humbled himself. He went to see Elisha and we are told that Elisha was too busy to even see Naaman. So he, Naaman got upset. He was angry. And he, he started leaving. He was, he was mad that Elisha couldn't even see him. So right before he left Samaria, Elisha sends his servant girl and says, go tell Naaman to wash seven times in the Jordan River. Now here's Naaman again. He's thinking, I'm, do you know who I am? I'm not going to wash myself in that muddy river. I can go back home and I can get into, you know, clean crystal pools. That I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to embarrass myself. And it is his servant that comes back to him and says, Obey the word of the prophet. And you know the rest of the story? Naaman got into the Jordan River. He humbled himself. He obeyed the word of the prophet, and it says that he was healed. He wasn't healed until the seventh time. You think what Naaman was thinking? Hey, maybe three times we'll be fine. Now you're sitting there just like me thinking, Really, God, that sounds crazy. God's going to ask us to do some things that just seem crazy. And it's going to take you being humble and obedient to the Lord. For healing comes when we're humble and obedient to him. And my friends, it may not just be a physical healing. It could be healing for this land. It could be healing for our nation. It could be healing for relationships. It could be healing in so many ways. And I don't want you to miss the reward of the Lord by you arguing or myself arguing with God. God, that's crazy. Surely there's an easier way. Let's be obedient to God. Why does humility matter? It puts credit where it's due. God, you our God, and I'm not. And here's, here's the thought. The only reason God lets you succeed is, that you can, is for you to make him known. He's given you gifts and talents to glorify him. Here's the principle. True humility leads us to pointing towards God. It's all about him, my friends. If it's about you, uh, we got it all wrong. 
So the question that remains today is this. How then should we live? Wow. How then should we live? What is God saying to the church? Church, I need you. I need you to be my beautiful bride. Philippians 2, verses 2 through 11, Paul teaches us that if Christ has made a difference, this is what it should look like. Verse 1. If you've gotten anything out of following Christ, if love has made any difference in you, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Another translation says harmonize with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Yuck. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be as obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. And Paul goes on, look, if you don't understand this piece, let me give you an example of how it does work. And he gives us a perfect example. Verse 5, think of yourselves as the way of, that Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity. He set being God aside. And he took on the status of a servant, becoming human. And having become human, he stayed human. He could have jumped back and forth. I want to be God today. I got to be human. No, he stayed human. It was an incredible humbling process this word says he didn't claim special privileges hey do you know who I am I'm God's son that should get me something instead he lived a selfish a selfless obedient life and then he died a selfless obedient death and the worst kind of death at that a crucifixion my friends humility at its finest so if you didn't get it in those first four verses, maybe you'll get it by, Paul says, look at Jesus. He's the way. And because of his obedience and humility, these next verses, there is great reward. Because of the obedience, that, because of his obedience, God lifted him up high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? amen? And call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. My friends, God's looking for those who will humble themselves and be obedient to him. He's looking for his church today. And we get it right. She's beautiful. But when we get it wrong, she's just plain ugly. And I'm asking you, we are the church. You are the church. Thomas, you are the church. Brother, Keola, you're the church. I'm asking you to help us be the beautiful bride. Get it right. Bend your knee to him. Listen to his voice. Take a pail and a towel. Wash some feet. 
Listen to his word. He's speaking to us today. It is true. He is still with us, and he still has a job for us to do. Would you humble yourself to the point where everything you do glorifies him? Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. I want to pray for us today as we close. And I'm going to ask that you just answer those couple questions um, in prayer. Um, Do you understand that everything that God has given you is to glorify him? Your finances, your job, your neighbors, the people you work with, with everything you do, let it point towards your heavenly father. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for the, giving us the opportunity to dive into your word. God, this is a broken world. It's full of strife and turmoil. And um, God, I know that you are the hope in the midst of everything that we're going through. And Lord, we look to you. Um, God, we need you. And God, I know you need your church. When Jesus left, he said, it'll be my church that will carry forth my message. God, it's not good enough just to come here and sit in a pew and get our ears tickled. You've called us to make a difference. So if we are in Christ, we are mandated to make a difference for you. In everything that we do, may you be glorified in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, guys, I appreciate you giving me uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. This is a word that God's been speaking to me as well, to us as a staff here at church. And I hope that he speaks to you today as you leave here. You are required as a disciple of him to make a difference in that world as you go through those doors right there. Amen? Amen. All right. Have a good day.